A very good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome to our session today. I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes for everybody to come in and settle down. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, very warm welcome to all of you. Um, so welcome to our session on career opportunities in humanities and social sciences. Um, this is uh, one of our uh, thematic webinars in the series that we have started um, since July and will be continuing till the end of uh, till till actually March next year. Um, so we're really delighted to bring this to you and we are covering a range of subjects. Uh, we've done computer science last week and we've done um, you know we've done sports and we've done creative arts. Uh, we've done engineering. We've done really exciting subjects and today's uh, subject is a little close to my heart because I'm a humanities student myself. So I'm really excited about this one um, and thank you all for joining us. So the idea of today's thematic webinar is to basically tell you about the opportunities you have um, as a student who might be looking to study abroad or might be looking at opportunities uh, to study humanities or social sciences in the UK. So what are the options available to you? Um, what kind of criteria are universities looking for? Uh, you know, what do you need to have in order right now to be able to apply? What kind of fees are you expected to pay? Are there scholarships available? All of these questions are going to be answered today. And uh, I welcome you all to ask as many questions as you have. We have a fantastic expert panel with us. Um, you'll see a small Q&A box. It's a small sort of a chat box with a question mark on it. So uh, if you click on that, you can post your question. Uh, you can ask questions to individual universities or you can ask questions in general about studying in the UK. Um, and we will make sure that we can answer as many of those as possible. Without further ado, I'm really excited about the panel today. Uh, we have with us uh, Doris Beckstein from University of Bristol. Um, Doris is International Market Development Manager for India and Africa. Welcome, Doris. We also have Holly Delafield from University of Bristol, who is the Employability Con Consultant for Social Sciences and Law. Uh, we will. We uh, we also have with us University of Bradford. We have Professor Peter Mitchell, who is the head of the School of Social Sciences, and we have Jeshri Chaturvedi, who is Regional Manager, South Asia and Indonesia. Welcome, Peter. Welcome, Jeshri, uh, to our session today. And finally, we have University of Leeds. We have Kasha. Uh, Ratcliffe, uh, who is international officer at Leeds, and we have a current student. We have Marina Thomas, um, uh, who is currently studying in Leeds and is going to be able to answer all those questions that you have about what is it like to study there? Can I cope with the um, academic pressure? Is it going to be different from the way I'm used to studying here? Um, so feel free to just be very forthcoming and frank with your questions and I will, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that this panel is able to answer all of that. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to request uh, University of Bristol. I'm going to request Doris to please share her screen and start the presentation. Um, like I said, uh, please do. Uh, please do continue to post your questions and we will make sure that we answer those. Doris, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so let me just, uh, could, you, could you confirm that you can see a screen? Am I sharing? I can see it. Yes, oh, yes. Fantastic. Perfect. Thank, perfect. Thank you so much. You're good to go. Yeah. OK, um, just a very brief introduction from me in, in general for the university and then very briefly after that um, you will be hearing from my colleague talking to you about um, career opportunities. So the University of Bristol um, has an office in India in Delhi um, as well, so we can share those details with you. But just to let you know roughly where we are, because people are not necessarily familiar with, um, we are um, in, on the west coast, just across from London and a half away from uh, from London by train a beautiful city um, and one of the economic powerhouses uh, net con big, biggest net contributor to the Treasury outside London. So that gives you an idea what a buzzy and a very you know vibrant place not for just for study but also for um, for work afterwards um, Bristol is. Um, some basic key facts it's one of those red brick universities, Russell Group University, um, we have 13 Nobel Prize 
uh, winners um, associated with us, over 100 nationalities um, studying with us. And I have to say the Indian group is growing and growing and growing. So that's a wonderful, buzzy environment. Anybody would join us. Um, rankings and reputations, we are ranking uh, as 62 worldwide and in the UK um, as number 10 and, um, you know, in, in general, a very good uh, solid university. My background that you hopefully see a little bit is, is um, I'm not actually there, as you can imagine, but that is where our students graduate. That's one of our key buildings. It's a campus. Um, uh, city center campus, so you're living and studying within the city center, but the city center is also the university, very, very much um, organically integrated. Um, and what can you study here? You can study here, we have six faculties, you can study all the obvious things. I think it's easier to tell you what we don't do. We don't do chemical engineering, and if you are looking for more applied courses, say fashion, design, all those kind of things, those we don't do, um, but we pretty much do absolutely everything else. Um, and I think with that, I will just stop and hand over to my colleague, perhaps only um, briefly saying, um, I know a lot of you will be interested in scholarships and we do give about two million pounds to international students. Um, so that's not for all the students, just for international students, um, including, of course, India. And we give those at undergraduate and postgraduate level. So with that, um, if I may, I'll be if I can work out how to, I'll stop sharing my screen and um, I'll hand over to Holly. Thanks, Doris. Hi, everyone. I will just start sharing my screen. OK, so hopefully you can see that. Um, so my name's Holly. I'm an employability consultant at the University of Bristol and I work specifically with the Faculty of Social Sciences and Law. So I'm going to be talking briefly today about the kind of career opportunities that you can access if you choose to study a social sciences subject and also a bit about the kind of career support we have at this university to help you get to where you want to be. So Doris just touched upon this briefly, but to go um, just to remind you again the different areas which are covered by social science and law faculty. So we have everything from accounting and finance, economics through to policy studies, sociology, politics, international studies, etc. So there's a broad range of subjects within the faculty. And you may be surprised to know that actually for most graduate jobs, you don't need to have a specific degree subject. So this is because employers recognise that whatever subject you study, you will be developing a range of really important transferable skills. So the kind of skills that you can use to go on to do any kind of job, whether that's related to your subject area or not. And the kind of transferable skills that you will be gaining if you choose to do a social science degree include analysis, communication, data collection, problem solving, such an important skill and really sought after by employers, project management and also very importantly teamwork. So you'll be working with other students on projects, your peers, and you'll be developing really important skills which are highly sought after by employers. So as we've seen, social science covers a broad range of subjects. So you will probably be unsurprised to know that the options, the career options are very broad. Just to give an idea of the kind of top areas that we find our students go on to work in after they've studied a degree in social science. So a broad range, some of these may be of interest to you, but the great thing about university is this is your opportunity to explore different options and work out what might be right for you. And to give you a slightly more concrete idea of where our students of social science at Bristol have gone on to work. So I've picked out some of the key areas, first being accountancy, professional services and consulting firms. So some big names here that you might recognise where our students have gone on to work. I should also mention that a lot of our students will go on to work for smaller and medium sized enterprises and we have a lot of support for that as well. Um, but here are some large organisations internationally renowned that I thought might mean something to you guys watching this at home. A lot of our students, particularly in politics, sociology, international studies, look to go on and work for government, whether that's central or local. Many students really enjoy the research side of things whilst they're at university and want to continue that by working for a research institute or a think tank and we have really good relationships with those organisations. 
banks and financial services. So these are both the financial um, financial side of things, but also the other kind of roles within these organisations. So marketing, communications, there are lots of opportunities within this sector. And finally, I wanted to mention in-house roles. So this is when you're working in an advisory role within any kind of organisation. So these span all sectors um, and some examples here. So from a wine merchants through to a transport organisation and our UK postal service. So the options are broad and this is by no means an exhaustive list um, example of where you could go on to work. But just to give you a flavour of the kind of opportunities open to you. And similarly, some examples of our international graduate destinations now. I won't spend too long on this. Um, just to um, pique your interest, hopefully, and give you a flavour of the kind of places our students have gone on to work. So we recognise that university is a really important opportunity for students to meet with employers and to find out what kind of thing they might be interested in doing. So we organise a lot of events with organisations either on campus or virtually. And I've included on the slide uh, our programme of activity for this autumn term. So it's our sector spotlight series. And we have a week of events centred around each of these different sector themes, including a careers fair. So this is where lots of employers will join an event to meet with students so students can ask questions, what it's like to work in that organisation, how they can get there, um, what kind of skills employers are looking for, etc. So lots of really exciting opportunities for students to research what they want to do with their social science degree whilst they're at university. This is a snapshot of our career support. Um, so everything from online live chat for students to ask really quick careers questions and get a quick response. We have literally hundreds of interactive resources on our website and we have a career ready course, which is bespoke for Bristol students, which allows students to work through a programme of career support activities and resources at their own pace. So we recognise that for international students, there are specific careers needs. And for that reason, we have some dedicated members of staff to providing international student support. So they have created a bespoke programme of events, so workshops, presentations specifically for international students. We also have a lot of communications directly to international students, which alerts them to the kind of events coming up, which will be of use to them and also our resources. And on our website, we have a section which is specifically for international students. To give you an idea of the kind of resources that I'm talking about, so one of our workshops is all about helping international students to communicate the value that they have as an international student to both employers back in their home country if they would like to return there or to UK employers. We know that a lot of our international students hope to work in the UK after they graduate, so here are some of our workshops which are aimed at supporting students with that. So from looking how to get work experience and internships in the UK through to actually getting a permanent job and the visa options. And on the other side, for students who are looking to return to their home country or work overseas after they graduate, we also have a lot of support to help with that. So Student Circus, you might have noticed that this was one of the graduate destinations that I showed for one of our international students a few slides back. So this is a really fantastic resource that we have for our international students. It's a website, a job platform, which is dedicated to opportunities for international students. So they have a really comprehensive list of jobs in the UK, which are guaranteed to be sponsored for international students and also jobs in a range of countries. You can see on the slide there's over 20 there um, recognised on the platform. So that's something that as a Bristol student you can access. Final thing from me is the Bristol Plus Award. So this is our University Employability Award and very popular with our international students. The idea behind this award is it allows students to be recognised for their extracurricular activities that they're doing whilst at university. So obviously your studies at university are a really big part of the experience, but the award aims to reward students for the other things they're doing. So student societies, um, work experience, internships, challenges, mentoring, anything else they're getting involved with. And it also gives a structure for students to reflect on the skills they're developing whilst achieving the award. So going back to the very beginning of my presentation, I was talking about the skills that you develop during your time as a social science student. It's really important that you reflect on those skills and recognise the value of those. 
And employers really like the award. They like seeing it on student CVs because it shows that students have the skills that they're looking for and that students have gone the extra mile during their time at Bristol. And just a quote there from a student who completed. This is an international student and it's talking about um, the enhancement of ability to network and communicate through doing the award and also how it helped boost confidence. That's everything from me. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Holly, and uh, thank you, Doris. That was really interesting. And I think what's particularly interesting is to highlight the career opportunities in humanities and social sciences, which is obviously what this uh, webinar is about. But I can speak, I think, from my context or our context in India that uh, definitely not now, but maybe when we were growing up, maybe 20, 30 years ago, there was a perception that you can't really do a lot with a humanities degree. You do need to get into the sciences. You need to, you know, study management and things like that to get a great job, a great, good, high paying job. And it's so incredible to see the massive range of options. And I know that 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 thinking isn't there anymore, but I can't imagine it's entirely gone away either. So I'm sure it's very interesting for our students here to see that and to see the wide kind of array of um, opportunities that are available to you. And on that note, I'm going to just quickly ask some questions that have come in. Um, I would request all the universities to have their video on for this. Um, just some general questions. OK, so uh, of a hold of a MA special and inclusive education course offered by. Uh, OK, no, sorry, that is from. OK, yeah, so this is a common student as well as a library and information science graduate who wants to pursue masters and a job in library and information science in the UK. Uh, can anybody kind of say a little bit more about that that subject uh, library and information science does anybody offer that or we can maybe come back to it later okay that's fine okay um this one is for leads uh, this is about kind of uh, for someone this is uh, utsarjana who has started who has started their phd in humanities at a college in india at bits Pilani, very well known institution and would like to visit the university of leeds um, on kind of sponsored projects and kind of uh, you know sort of knowledge development uh, workshops and maybe short courses and things like that is that an option at all? Um, it would very much depend probably on the graduate school. So on the um, on our website, it does um, list the contact details for all the graduate schools. So depending on the area of the PhD, I would recommend reaching out to them and they should be able to put you in the right in contact with the right people who might be able to advise. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Kasia and uh, it's I mean, the person is obviously working on a project where Leeds has already contributed, so I think they want to explore that further. So that sounds interesting. Uh, I would recommend the student to please get in touch with Leeds. Uh, we will be sharing. We have shared the email IDs or we will be sharing it in the chat uh, soon so you can do that. Um, could somebody talk about PhD requirements in humanities? What does it take? How does one go about it? Um, Peter, can I can I come to you on that? Yeah, with pleasure. Um, I do have some experience uh, supervising students, including international PhD students, actually in, including um, students from India as well. In, in even students who um, who are recruited from a British Council fair. Um, and um, what I would say is that um, to do a PhD, I think primarily it's important to um, find the topic itself, one that's very engaging and one that you're really passionate about. Um, and that's that's what's going to drive you through because doing a PhD is uh, it's going to be at least three years of quite intense work, um, very, very focused work. So it's absolutely critical that the topic that you're engaged in is one that you find particularly absorbing and particularly attractive. And um, what you'll find is that the skills that you build up as you're going through that journey will really flourish in terms of the skill to write reports, 
the skill to analyze data, whether that's quantitative or qualitative data. And you'll find that these are all transferable skills. Indeed, um, Economic and Research Council UK define a PhD essentially as research training. So the core of it is training in research, and you can then apply those skills to other areas after you've completed your programme. Do you think that uh, answers the question? I think so. I think so. Very nicely. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and I'm sure you find that useful. Uh, this is for the student, but you know, do again get in touch with the university. See if you want to know more. Um, here is a student who is currently studying in the UK MSc Psychology, but would like to know what are the career opportunities in psychology moving on after the master's program? Uh, Doris or Holly, is, can, would, would anyone else want to come in on this? Kasha? Probably Holly um, from Bristol would be better yeah, than me. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I've just posted a link in the chat, actually. There's a really useful website for psychology students, the British Psychological Society, and they have a career section which talks you through um, the different kind of routes if you want to remain within psychology. Um, so you yeah. see there's lots of different specialisms within that. But um, also, back to my presentation what i was saying about the broadness of transferable skills it's not just limited to psychology so i guess it's for this student to be thinking about where their passion lies what they're interested in what kind of jobs are out there and then think about what kind of route they want to go down um so it's such a personal choice of course choosing your career but i think that website if you're thinking about going down the psychology route is very helpful and it is uk specific I yeah. might just add, um, my yeah. specialism is psychology and um, in my presentation I'm going to present a slide where I talk about careers specifically in psychology. Oh, that's brilliant. That's perfect. So then let's move on from that question. We'll wait for your presentation, Peter. We're going to come to that in a minute. I just wanted to cover a couple more questions. Um, when it comes to scholarships and I, could somebody, um, Kasia, if you want to maybe just come in on this, uh, when people want to go for a PhD, how should they sort of figure out the planning? Because, you know, scholarships for PhD are obviously not very common. You would need to either self fund or look for funding from within the program that you're applying to. How would you advise students to go about that? Um, so Peter might be able to add, but I'll, I'll start. Um, so on our website, when you're searching for the PhDs, you can search for projects and there is a funding section. So you can look at funding that is available. Um, in particular projects. That's kind of all the advice um, we have on it. It very much depends on the area that you're looking to do the PhD in. Yeah. Peter, anything to add to that, do you think? Is that a... What, what you'll find is that some universities um, have a scholarship scheme specifically for international students. And I certainly know at my previous institution, which was the University of Nottingham, there was the Overseas Research Scholarship Scheme. And I also recall that one of the students that I supervised from India was on yeah. a Commonwealth scholarship to do her PhD. I don't know if that yeah. scheme still exists. Yeah, it does. Uh, which is, yeah, exactly. So there are a couple of scholarships which can fund a PhD. I would request a student to go on the British Council website, click on the scholarships tab and just um, to see what's available, uh, Commonwealth is one, and you know that 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 could be helpful. I'm going to take one more question before I move on to Bradford's presentation. What are the opportunities for digital humanities? That's a really interesting one. Is does anybody want to come in on that? Doris, can I ask you to just maybe just share your thoughts on it? I know it's something a little. Yeah, if you're on some, mute. yeah. It is something uh, a little. Uh, I was. I, I saw that question early, and I thought I actually kind of wonder exactly what that is. All I can say about that as a, as an initial impression is that. Um, um, what you find in universities in the UK now more and more is interdisciplinary uh, courses and um, or courses with innovation, for example, at um, the University of Bristol, where students are encouraged to uh, work across disciplines and faculties and, you know, wh where, where those kind of new, new kind of hybrid um, disciplines might come up. Um, I, uh, at my university, I can't put my finger on anything immediately other than with innovation. 
perhaps maybe okay. archiving and things like that uh, yeah, all, all, all kinds of things, uh, you know, that I would have to say, you know, spring to mind, but I'm not sure whether they addressed the question. But the first answer would be just Google it, see what comes up and, and follow that trail. Uh, I think that seems to help most most queries. <laughs> Sorry, it can't be more. <laughs> no, no, thank you, Doris. That's that's uh, useful. And I think it does cover archiving and things like that. So I'm sure there are universities who will who will be teaching those subjects. Um, I'm going to last question. This one's for Marina. Um, what are the advantages or disadvantages of being an international student looking for work or going to work in the UK? Uh, how are you better off or worse off than a UK citizen? How do you click? How you know how do you how do you position yourself in the market? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I think an advantage of being an international student is that you come with uh, knowledge from your home country and that is not exactly an advantage or a disadvantage as such but i think the skills that you bring from your home country it brings a variety into the kind of learning that you take up when you are in a foreign university and that goes on to boost your career prospects when you join a, a corporate setup or a company as such the disadvantage in some cases could be language, uh, uh, particularly when I joined Leeds in the beginning, I found the British accent uh, quite strong, but then I've got used to it now. But, uh, but the university uh, definitely has been very, very helpful and they have uh, workshops which help you with language skills and even academic writing. So I think that is something international students can really like uh, use and that's really helpful when you join a new uh, company. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Marina. Uh, with that, I'm going to request Peter to present on uh, for Bradford. Um, there are lots of really interesting questions coming in, but we'll park that for after your presentation. Over to you, Peter. Well, it's my pleasure. Let me just see if I can load up the slide. Can you see that? Yes, yes, we can see that you just want to go on. Perfect. That's perfect. Excellent. So let me begin then. Um, <clears throat> well, the first question is, where are we? And the answer is that we're right in the middle of the UK and we're actually um, right next door to Leeds. So Leeds is our very close neighbour and we're the first UNESCO city of film in the world. Bradford is the youngest city in Europe with 29% of our population under the age of 20. Um, and we're surrounded by beautiful countryside, really beautiful countryside. And Bradford <clears throat> is considered the curry capital of the UK. And not meaning to advertise anybody in particular, but um, the city of Bradford is very proud to be host of Akbar's King of Curry um, restaurant empire. And I understand they've spent millions, literally millions of pounds on their on their um, curry restaurant. <clears throat> I think what you'll find um, with the Indian food in, in England or in Britain generally is that it's um, because we have several generations of uh, fa families whose background is Indian. Um, but for several generations have lived in the UK and the food, the way of making food has evolved. So it's a little bit different from the um, food that you'll find in India. I'm, I'm not saying it's better or it's worse. I mean, it's just it's just different. It's just all evolved in a slightly different way. But I think you'll find that the quality is very impressive of that food and um, I'm sure you'd enjoy it. So the University of Bradford, we have, um, we're not one of the largest universities. In fact, we're quite modest in size by UK standards. We have just over 10,000 current students, um, but importantly, 21% um, of those students are defined as international or at least from the European Union or beyond. And of those international students, we see um, more than 130 nas different nationalities represented and on campus. And we have alumni from 175 countries around the world. Um, we have 357 academic staff awards a higher education fellowship and in total um, 1,600 staff approximately across the university. So we have 
um, a strong team of dedicated and well-qualified academic staff who are very well used to um, supporting and helping international students. And um, Bradford is seen as, um, recently seen as the UK's most improved city. Um, certainly in 29, it received this accolade. Um, I mean, apart from the, the curry houses, which I've already mentioned, but apart from some of the world-class museums and the uh, fine Victorian buildings, it was one of the richest cities in the world in Victorian times. Um, but also, as I said, the beautiful countryside around this area makes it uh, one of the really fine cities in the UK. Um, but one thing I particularly want to emphasize about the city and in particular about the University of Bradford is that um, we take diversity and social inclusion very, very seriously, as you can see by the wide range of nations from which we have students, that we draw our students from. But in recognition of this, we are identified by the Times um, in the Good University Guide as the University of the Year for Social Inclusion. So we work very, very hard to make all of our students feel welcome, particularly international students. So why would you choose to come to the University of Bradford? We have subject specialist research active teaching staff, particularly in the area of social sciences, particularly in the area of um, peace studies and international relations, which I'll say more about later, and particularly in the area of psychology as well. And as I said, I'm, my specialism is in psychology. Um, speaking personally, I've written um, seven books on psychology, more than a hundred research articles. I'm a fellow of the British Psychological Society, and I'm a former editor in chief of the British Journal of Psychology. And um, you know, I can speak for myself, but also for the team as well. We have uh, a set of very well qualified and highly research active staff, which is important because that means that the teaching that you experience is led by research, it's led by people who really understand research, who, who are at the leading edge. And in consequence, we have very high levels of student satisfaction, as demonstrated in the National Student Survey, um, and we have ex expertise in areas in particular that lead to um, lucrative and satisfying career opportunities. And one of the things we're most proud about is the Career Booster Scheme. So the Career Booster Scheme, what's that? It's a unique employability program that's designed to help students develop essential graduate attributes and in-demand skills uh, that are relevant to the needs of the world of work. We have dedicated career booster weeks, um, once in the autumn term and once in the spring, spring term, where students um, will not do so many academic classes, but rather will be attending classes in which they have an opportunity to meet future employers. Uh, people will come into the university um, from the world of employment, from the world of work. They will give you excellent tips on how to make yourself employable and they will present to you all sorts of very attractive opportunities for you to apply for jobs when you've completed your degree. So we have some very distinguished guest speakers um, who can speak on global issues and on an in international research agenda that is dedicated and designed to give you really excellent career opportunities. So where do our graduates go to? Um, well, we have um, more than 135,000 alum alumni who are in, in influential positions worldwide, and they are a force for good. They're making the world a better place. They're helping their countries develop, and they're helping um, businesses develop as well. Um, here are some of our top employees that you can see the logos here. Um, but one thing I want to emphasize is that we stay very close to our alumni. They continue to connect with us and they continue to connect with our current students to help them in turn to find places in work. Well, I said earlier that I was going to speak about psychology and so I will. Um, and a good question is what can I do with a 
uh, what, what kind of career can I do with a degree in psychology? A few years ago, um, the Guardian newspaper, a very respected newspaper in the UK, published an article on the employability of graduates from different um, kinds of subjects. And psychology came out as one of the top, in other words, a, a subject where if you were to study psychology, it makes you particularly employable. Why is that? Well, the reason is because there's a wide range of employment opportunities that are offered or afforded by having a degree in psychology. There are some areas which are specific to psychology, but psychology graduates can also go into um, general kinds of employment, such as in advertising and marketing, recruitment personnel, police, criminal justice, probation, social care, um, and into business and banking. But if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see here some of the more specialised areas that psychologists can go into. And one thing that I would point out is that doing a degree in psychology at a British university, including the University of Bradford, will um, confer um, graduate, re graduate basis of registration with the British Psychological Society, which means that you can join the Charter of Psychologists and that makes you employable, makes you employable as a chartered psychologist. So you can therefore go on to do specialised study such as a forensic psychologist, clinical educational, neuropsychologist, sports psychology, counselling, or you can go into academic or research. And some of these careers are very, very well paid um, and are very satisfying careers, particularly, for example, a clinical psychologist who would do a doctorate in clinical psychology and then typically would work in the National Health Service with the title of doctor. So another program that we're offering is in criminology and criminal behaviour. And this is offered by the Department of Sociology and Criminology. Um, this is a very attractive program um, that's attractive to international students and to home students. Um, students who go into this subject um, seek career opportunities in the area of the criminal justice system, in policing, and also in the prison service and other areas. Um, so this is a particularly attractive um, employment opportunity. Um, and now I want to move on to talk about peace studies and international development. And we have very strong master's programmes and these programmes also come with the opportunity to take a three month placement. The three month placement um, in an organisation is a really great benefit because it allows you to connect with the world outside of academia, outside of education. And that kind of contact and that network can stand you in really good stead when you're applying for a job. It makes you very highly employable. Um, you can see the list here of um, degrees that we're offering. And one of the most popular is the second from bottom, which is project planning and management. That's a master's degree. And this year it looks so we're set to um, have an intake of more than 100 uh, students, the great majority international students onto that program who are going to be starting this year. It's a big program, it's a well-resourced program, it's terrifically attractive to international students and in recognition of the value that we're giving to international students with this program, we are supporting students with a, five, a scholarship of £5,000 per year. Um, so these are um, programmes that we're really proud of and we want to help. We want international students to come onto these programmes and we want to help them to do so. And that is the reason why we're offering a very generous scholarship. These programmes are highly oversubscribed, as you could imagine, um, but nevertheless, um, we feel that um, they can do a great service to the international community. And that is the reason why we want to support our students, particularly our international students on these programmes. This, these programmes are um, offered by the Department of Peace Studies and International Development. 
This is the first Department of Peace that is ever to be established in the UK. It dates back to 1973. It has an, an extremely distinguished history and it um, is home to very, very well quali qualified academic staff. Um, so there you can get an extremely valuable um, internationally recognized education. It will give you an opportunity to go into careers in the um, diplomatic service, uh, depending on which program you do, but it could be in the diplomatic service. It could be with the United Nations. Um, but one thing for sure is that we have some very esteemed alumni, including uh, people who have become prime ministers of their nations um, and including people who are really well known on the international scene as leading um, entrepreneurs. So these are the benefits that you can um, attain from uh, an education at the University of Bradford. Well, thank you very much for listening and um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That was really, really useful, uh, especially what a lovely last last slide that was. I think that's uh, truly inspiring. Um, and I hope our students here are inspired by some of these people and what they've gone on to achieve. Um, I do want to go into some questions before I request leads to come on so if people can just come back on video. Um, what kind this one is for leads. Um, so Kasha, if you want to come in here, what kind of career trajectories are possible for students studying humanities or sustainability courses at Leeds? Um, so I will be talking about this a bit in the presentation, um, okay. but quickly we have um, dedicated faculty and school support within the career centre at Leeds. So whatever subject you're doing, you will have um, employability officers that can support you in that area. Um, so you kind of have access to that support rather than generic um, career support. That's great. And uh, we have some of the questions already answered. So thank you, Jeshu. Thank you, Holly, for answering that question um, from TIS. Uh, that's really useful. Uh, OK. And what are the scopes in studying? What is the scope for studying comparative literature in the UK, especially for like post postgraduate? Does anybody want to come in on that? OK. Uh, Kasia, can I? Yes, Doris, Sorry. come in. So what yeah. I would say is um, uh, not particularly at my university, because although we are doing modern languages and of course you can do English literature and there's a lot of breadth within the English literature program, there's uh, comparative literature is a very specific area. But uh, so, so in the UK, I'm sure um, if, if it's not represented here with uh, Leeds or Bradford, um, you know, just do look wider, but um, it, it certainly uh, exists and it gives you a lot of studying this kind of stuff. It's something I studied many years ago. Um, it gives you lo lots of good skills that are uh, quite transferable into different careers, I would say, as well. Um, but yeah, I, not, not for Bristol itself, but maybe for my other colleagues. Does Bradford or Leeds offer in uh, comparative literature? Um, not as far as I'm aware as a course like that. We obviously have modern languages, English literature, um, things like translation studies, um, yeah. cultural yeah, studies. So very similar. So similar, um, but, but nothing exactly. But yeah, if, um, yeah. if they want to search through the course on the website, they might find something yeah. suitable in that. Yeah, but there are, you know, if you want to also look into other universities in the UK, definitely they do offer it. So do also check that. Um, I'm going to ask a couple more questions. What are the career options ahead of um, international politics and relations in the UK? Does anyone want to come in on that? I, I could comment Peter. on that. If yeah, you like. thank you, Peter. Um, yes, please. Because we do offer, you know, particularly those master's programs that I was referring to. Yes, please. And uh, many of the people who graduate from that program aspire to work for United Nations or to work in the diplomatic service, to work in the um, in, in the government of their nation, particularly in the department that deals with international issues, and also 
with um, non-government organisations as well who have an international perspective and an international reach. Thank you, Peter. So a lot really, a lot of really um, exciting opportunities there. Um, just for those asking about, about postdoctoral fellowships, I would recommend that you speak to the universities that you're interested in to look at the exact opportunities available. Um, these will kind of depend on what you know, projects they are focusing on at the time. So I think that's the best approach there. Um, here's a very interesting question on opportunity in sociology, social work or religion in theology studies, um, you know, as a master's. Can anybody come on that? Come in on that, please. Peter, Doris. I can you about yes, um, social work, if you like, because we do yes, offer um, programs in social work, even though I didn't comment on them. Um, but we offer um, a master's degree in social work and um, students who go on that program um, are able to qualify as a professional social worker. So it's important that they've done um, a, a suitable degree or a relevant de undergraduate degree that gives them some foundation that qualifies them to go on to the master's degree in social work. Yeah. As long as they can do that, then they can do the master's degree um, and then they can qualify as a professional social worker who can work in the UK. But we also have some international students on that programme who are intending to go back to their home nation to um, to apply the skills um, in some cases to help um, or, or to the benefits of, of their home nation to share best practice yeah. um, across nations as well. Thank you for that. And I'm going to stick with you again, Peter, for the next one. What are the requirements typically for a degree for a degree in applied psychology at the master's level? Um, well, the master's degrees, uh, many of them are in applied psychology and it depends on what the particular application is. Um, so, for example, one kind of applied psychology would be in forensic psychology. Um, and a typical qualification requirement would be an upper second class degree um, in um, a, a degree in psychology, an undergraduate degree in psychology that's accredited by the British Psychological Society. Thank you. Uh, Doris, can I come to you for the next one? Can somebody who's doing engineering at the undergraduate level go on to study social science? Um, that's quite a, quite a, a a difficult question. What, what I would suggest is um, that when you are looking at the description of the entry requirements, so all universities will give you a very um, detailed um, summary of the course content at, at master's level and then also the intro requirements and, and some of those courses may, may not, it may not be possible because what they're looking for is a background in, 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 a, in, a, in a humanities discipline or social sciences uh, or anything with an, an, an kind of more essay writing background. So it might not be possible. That's not to say there might not be one out there that is a bit of a hybrid or um, it's just more, more uh, general in terms of entry requirements. So entry requirements are always very specific to a course at a university. So, so in general, I would say might not be the best fit. But again, sometimes we have situations where a student isn't an obvious best traditional fit, but has done other things alongside or um, can demonstrate, you know, writing skills if, if that's one of the things that's required. So so do always check with the university or targeting. Yeah, exactly. And I think always ask. Yes, Kesha. Yeah. And just to add um, to what Dora said, that we at Leeds do have um, admissions teams for each area. And if you're looking at courses and you don't meet the requirements, it's good to get in touch with them and just say, is there an alternative course that I might be suitable for? Yep. And on that note, um, Kasha, I'm going to come to you for your presentation. Yeah. Um, I'll just want to add on Bradford. Um, we do accept students with pre-masters in, in similar situations. So, for example, if student is coming from engineering background and looking forward for something in social sciences, they not might not be um, eligible directly to join the course, but they can definitely join via pre-masters degree, which is another six months course, which they can do, and then they can come to the master's degree in social sciences. 
thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jayashree. That's really useful. Um, Kasha to you now and then after Kasha's presentation, we're going to answer as many questions as we can in the Q&A box. So hang in there. Uh, there are really good ones in there. So we'll come back. Um, I can see your screen, Kasha. It looks good. You might, yeah, perfect. Brilliant. Great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is Kasha and I am an international officer for South Asia at the University of Leeds. We do have um, two offices based in India um, and a team working out there that um, would be able to support any students applications through to arriving. I'm sure Marina um, used them while she was securing her place at Leeds. Um, I'll now let Marina introduce herself briefly. Well, I'll, I'll introduce her in case you can't unmute. So um, it's a current international student um, and she's studying MA New Media and she's going to talk a bit later about um, her experiences and also the things that she's used in our career centre. Um, so a bit about the university. Um, so we are part of the prestigious Russell Group. So it's a group of 24 research intensive UK universities. We are one of the largest universities in the UK. We have over 38,000 students from over 170 different countries. The nice thing about Leeds is that it's a single site campus. So um, all of your courses and buildings would be on the campus and some of the accommodation, but it is only um, between a 10 to 15 minute walk into the city centre of Leeds. Um, we're consistently ranked um, in the top 100 universities in the world in the QS World Rankings, um, and a lot of our subjects rank um, highly individually as well. Ooh. Sorry. Um, so we have seven faculties at the university. I'll be talking about two of these today um, to fit with the webinar. You've gone on mute, Kasia. Can you hear me yeah. now? Yeah, 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 you're back. OK, thank you. Um, so, yeah, there are seven faculties and um, in those faculties you will have dedicated student support and career support, um, as well as I mentioned earlier, employability officers um, supporting you throughout your career as well. Um, so in the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Cultures, and we do have one of the broadest portfolios in the arts. Um, and our specialisms include things like art and design, media and communication, music, theatre, cultural industries, history, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about media and art specifically. So our courses in media um, look at things about sharing the knowledge, values and belief through things like television, journalism, film, photography, online media. We have um, great facilities available, a cinema, fully equipped industry standard TV and radio studios, um, Adobe Creative Cloud, Avid Media Composer. So graduates um, in this area um, have gone on to do things such as journalists, news presenters, producers, management of media organisations, um, public relation experts. And obviously we have uh, Marina joining us today that is studying MA New Media. Um, so art and design, um, we benefit from a strong relationship um, with businesses as well as teaching staff who have a significant amount of expertise um, working within the design industry and that will feed into your future career opportunities um, as well as the career support. Um, so during the um, your course, you have opportunities to develop things such as your professional portfolio, um, presentation and research skills, consultancy, consultancy projects that will be set by industry professionals. Um, some of our previous students have worked with companies such as LG, Samsung, Unilever, um, and the fields that they've gone into range from advertising, marketing, fashion technology, um, to name a couple. And then the other faculty is the Faculty of Social Sciences. Um, so you can see the schools that are based um, within this area on the screen here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about School of Law on the next slide. Um, 
but for example, politics and international studies. Um, I think there was a question about that earlier. So some of the areas that our graduates have gone into are things like the civil service, media, um, non-governmental organisations, international organisations, um, United Nations, World Bank. Um, so I will move on to law. So um, we do have the School of Law's community engagement pro bono opportunities that are open to all students within the school um, and it just allows you to put into practice um, the knowledge and skills you develop throughout your studies. Um, all courses at Leeds have an employability focus and it's really important. Um, it's a good opportunity to stand out kind of in a competitive graduate market as well. And um, the City of Leeds has over 200 law firms um, and employs about 22,500 people and about 9,000 lawyers and we do have really strong links um, with the law firms in the city. So the city of Leeds is the third largest in the UK. Um, it's a smaller city compared to London um, so even though it might feel like there's um, less jobs available than somewhere like London um, there's obviously less com competition for these roles. Um, it's really student friendly. There's four universities in Leeds, so it has a really good student network as well. Outside of London, um, it is one of the largest um, centres for business, legal and financial services. Um, so I've spoken a little bit about law and then um, we also have Channel 4. One of the main channels in the UK has just opened their headquarter in Leeds. And then finally, we are a centre for culture, sports and the arts. Um, we do have rugby, football and cricket stadiums. And to touch briefly on the cricket, um, this week's test match between England and India is actually um, at Headingley Stadium in Leeds. Um, Headingley is a very popular student um, location in the city as well. And I'm going to talk briefly about um, the Career Centre, you can see on the screen the things that you would have access to. You'd have access to some of them before you start and during your time. We really recommend that students utilise everything available to them and start thinking about career opportunities as soon as you're at university. Um, and then I'm going to pass on to Marina rather than me talking through them to talk about some of the facilities in the Career Centre that she has used. Thanks, Kesha. And sorry about my audio earlier. Um, so yeah, as everyone knows, I'm Marina. I'm studying a postgraduate degree in the University of Leeds. And I uh, took uh, made use of few of the services of the Career Centre, which were extremely helpful to me. So very early on um, in my term time, we were told that international students need to follow a different pattern of CV writing and cover letter writing because it's different in the UK and I made use of that. I uh, made use of the portal that is available in the Career Centre, which helps you in guiding as to if your CV is up to uh, UK standard of employment or not. I even had one-to-one -one sessions with a placement officer who was from my own faculty of uh, media and communication itself. So I received uh, specific guidance from her regarding um, media specific jobs. And then I even attended seminars and sessions which were uh, designed for international students and uh, specifically even designed for South Asian students, which were really helpful in understanding uh, what kind of jobs that I should be looking out for here and what my visa allows me to do and not. And last but not the least, the Career Centre also posts about job opportunities that are full time, that are part time, um, and also about internships that you could do while you're a student here and then you can work around your academic schedule. Um, so you can go on for the next slide. Sure. The next slide. Um, yeah, so talking about the opportunities that the Career Center provides, we have something called Global Careers which is a week long event where you have a lineup of sessions and activities that uh, allows students to attend skill based workshops and meet with uh, potential employees and even um, attend alumni talks where you can even network with them. I actually happen to meet most of the alumni from my School of Media and Communication through these seminars. I even met some really prominent journalists 
from the BBC, the Guardian, um, Channel 4, to name a few. And then I went on to network with them on social media platforms, which I think was exceptional because that would have never been possible if I was uh, in uh, some other university, maybe back home in my home country. And apart from that, we also are associated with Student Circus, which um, hosts jobs that are specifically designed for international students. And they sponsor jobs that have uh, the tier two skill visa um, available for students. And then apart from the global careers, there are school-based events as well, like the School of Media and Communication holds an event called Media Futures, where again, you get to um, network with alumni, you get to talk to them, you get to ask them questions about what the media industry is like in the UK. And I think that's extremely helpful in my case. Now, if we can go on to the next slide. So talking about finding opportunities, uh, I am sure that many of you will be aware that the UK has recently launched the Graduate Truth Visa, which allows graduates to stay on for two years in the UK. And while you're here, you can look for jobs and then you can uh, stay on and look for jobs. And even if you do not have one, you can continue to find something. And once you find, you can move on to your uh, skilled work tier two visas. And one thing about the graduate route visa is that you will need to be in the UK to apply for it. Like for example, in my case, in a few weeks, I'll be finishing my course and then maybe I'll get my degree in around November after which I can apply for this visa and continues to stay on for two years. So I think this is an excellent opportunity. And as you can see from all our slides that students have so much to do when they are in the UK and specifically when you come to the University of Leeds, you get many, many opportunities as an international student. And uh, speaking of which, I got to uh, make use of one opportunity, which was linked to Leeds. We can go on to the next slide. So to tell you a little bit about Link to Leeds, I am a Link to Leeds ambassador and Link to Leeds ambassadors basically help new students in preparing for their new academic life in the university and in Leeds. And uh, we also host social events for new students. So you get to meet new people and make friends and even give you first hand advice about how the city life is going to be, how to prepare for quarantine, which is what we are doing currently a lot. And we have over 50 plus ambassadors from different parts of the world and speak uh, coming from different schools in the university. So if there is anything that you would like to ask about specifically about your course or school, you can get in touch with an ambassador who comes from your school. Or if you wanna talk to somebody who comes from your home country, you can even uh, reach out to uh, ambassadors like that. You can get in touch with us through email, video calls or social media. And uh, so that is it. That is from my side. I hope this was helpful. And uh, yeah, you can always reach out to me through Link to Leeds if you want to. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to Marina. So just finally, thank you for listening. Um, some details on our South Asia office, um, as well as the social media that you can contact and follow them on as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Kasia and uh, Marina. That was super useful. I can see some questions. I'm going to quickly go through them. I know we're over time, but they, these obviously, these always go over time because there's so many good questions coming in. So if everyone can quickly come on video, I'm going to request very quick answers from everybody. I'm going to skip the questions on PhD and fellowships and things like that because those are very specific to institutions. Um, there's a question for Bradford. Um, uh, Peter or Jeshri, whoever wants to. Oh, OK, there you go, Jeshri. You've just answered that. Thank you so much. Um, Kasia, does Leeds have any scholarships for media students? Um, yes, I believe we ha did have some last year. We're still waiting for the final details for September 2022. But on our scholarship pages, um, you can go into the individual schools as well as the generic ones and see any international scholarships available in the school. Brilliant. Um, Marina, what are the career opportunities in journalism media for international students in the UK? 
Uh, yeah, there are tons of opportunities. Like I said, we have alumni working in the BBC and Channel 4 and many uh, big media organizations. So when you have those sessions with the Career Center or with your school, you can always get in touch with them. And uh, you get a very close idea of all the opportunities, all the vacancies that they post once you attend these sessions. Uh, like I'm studying new media, and that gives me a chance to work in the field of journalism as well as digital media. So I think that that's very flexible, yeah. and then it, it's very the kinds Thanks. of opportunities you get. Yeah. Thanks, Marina. Uh, Peter, um, is is a PhD better or a psych D degree if I want if someone wants to practice as a psychology? I mean, I'm assuming that's a doc a doctorate in, in psychology. If you want to, <coughs> yeah, I'm happy to reply. So, if you want to work as a clinical psychologist, then you need um, a qualification, uh, a DCLIN, a doctorate in clinical psychology. And that will give you the training that you need, the accredited training that you need to work as a professional clinical psychologist. If you do a PhD, it wouldn't give you that um, professional qualification, rather it would give you training in research. And the route that you're going down then perhaps would be more in terms of, you could work as a researcher for an organisation, or you could work as a, an academic, something like that, but that's the route you go down for a PhD. Thank you. I'm skipping the questions which have already been answered. There are a few from Bristol, so thank you, Doris and Holly, for answering those already. Um, there's a question for Bradford on psychology, but I think that's been covered sufficiently by Peter. Uh, but Jesh, if you want to pop a link in there, um, do so, because I, I know we've covered that quite a lot. Um, I'm not sure who this question is for, but uh, do the universities here offer masters uh, in arts or an MA in psychoanalytic studies or similar? Okay, that's it's not available. These universities. I, I, think, the do I think the closer we get, if I may say so, would be yes, um, an undergraduate degree in psychology with counseling. Okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, there are some questions on what can one do with uh, with a uh, with a history degree. So um, thank you, Holly, for answering that. But if anybody else wants to come in, please do. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that we've answered all our questions here. Uh, there was a question. OK, microbiology. OK, can somebody I think um, anybody can come in here. Uh, what about the IELTS in, uh, you know, do, does one need an IELTS uh, if one wants to study in the UK and in in a humanities or social sciences uh, degree? And, you know, what are the requirements for that? Is it mandatory? Uh, does anybody want to come in? Yeah, yes. I'm, I'm happy to take it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah, an English language test is a requirement um, for all courses um, and the requirement can vary, so it's worth double checking. Um, the only thing, um, it might be the same at other universities, but at Leeds, um, we would also look at the standard 12 English as well. Um, so it may be that they've met um, with that requirement and then an additional English language test isn't required. Some people are nodding, so I feel like that's similar across the board. <laughs> Uh, if yes, I may, um, yeah. so yeah, so at Bristol, um, and we can post a link in a minute. We have uh, our English language requirements in profiles. So each course has been assigned a profile, going from A to uh, G or H, I think. A being the hardest and equivalent of IELTS eight, but um, we do accept um, uh, the uh, standard twelve. CBSC, ICE, we, we also accept if you're going into postgraduate, um, if the university, um, we, have, we have a small group of universities where we know obviously the medium of instruction is English, um, then we will accept um, them without any further um, uh, or additional tests. Brilliant. I would Thank just you. like to add to yes. that. Like at Bradford, it's similar to what, um, like, you know, both um, Doris and Kashia has said. Um, but in addition to that, at Bradford, we also have our own English language test, which we run um, usually throughout the year in India. So, students, if they are 
they they required to take one of the tests like we accept IELTS, TOEFL, PTE, but they're finding it difficult to take those tests considering especially with the lockdown and uh, situations in India, we do have an option where they can do our Bradford English test as well. That's really useful. Thanks, uh, Jayashree. Um, when is the application process starting for the year 2022 fall intake? Can somebody answer this for both UG and PG? At Bradford, it's already started, so applications are open for next year, so students are free to go ahead on the website and put in their application, and there's no application fee as well. Um, Thanks, Bradford. Is that true for Bristol and Leeds as well? So um, applications for postgraduates aren't quite open um, for Leeds yet. Probably okay. end of September, October it will be open and then um, UG September. I Thank think you, UG you can Bristol. already go into UCAS, can't you? And you can, was it the 9th of September? So you can start your application and then I think 7th or 9th of September you can launch it as it were and in terms of applying for postgraduate at Bristol just look at the course pages each of them you can apply online directly from the course page and the button there will either say you know it's 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 live or it's it's not open for applications yet but it'll be September as well we only have also one intake per year that could be different at different universities we only do September slash October intakes once a year yeah, that's the same for Leeds, it's just September. We have two intakes, so we also have January intake we are, where we are running the majority of our master's courses. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. That's really useful to know. I'm just going to ask Doris to come in on this one. I know you've put it in the chat, but I've got a few questions here on it. What are career opportunities after studying history? History? Well, that's a really good one because history, uh, certainly at the University of Bristol, um, uh, is a very facilitating subject. What I mean by that is that when you examine, um, we, we, I've done this a, a few years ago, I used, I, I did this, I looked at famous people with, with careers that might inspire young people to be like them, whether that was media or entrepreneurs, and you look back at their degree, and quite often it was history. In fact, you know, it's one of those degrees that is so versatile, you, you'll pick up critical thinking skills, you, all kinds of skills, communication skills. So it's very facilitating. Uh, the m minority would be going into teaching, the minority would be going into research, but um, mostly history um, graduates and, and it's similar for English or, or language graduates as well. Yeah. I know that both Holly and myself, we are language gra foreign language graduates uh, and this is where, you know, what we do now. So it gives us a lot of opportunity. And what I would say is that if you want to study that, you really, really should pick the university that can give you that history course that you want because the more you can pour your energy and heart into it, the better your degree outcome. The better your degree outcome, the you know, the better your chances of, of landing in an industry that you'd like. But it's a wide, wider field to go into. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doris. Uh, this is a question that's been unanswered. So I just want to pick up on this. Um, explain about humanitarian forensics activities in the aftermath of disasters. I think was discovered in one of the presentations. Is there anybody who wants to come in on this or we can skip this if that's not covered here? OK, that's fine. And um, Peter, if I can just ask you the last question, there are a few questions around going into academia after finishing your postgraduate uh, studies in the UK or you know even under under undergraduate. So what are one's options in the UK and how easy or difficult is it? Marina, you can come in on this because you've obviously done your further studies, but Peter, do you want to just tell us how one approaches a career in academia? Well, um, <clears throat> I mean, obviously in the first instance, it would be good advice, in my opinion, to do a PhD. So you do your undergraduate degree, you might do a master's degree, um, but it's important to do a PhD. And then typically, if you were aiming or aspiring to um, work in one of the top universities internationally, then it would be important also. It depends on the discipline, it depends on the subject, obviously, but the subjects I'm familiar with, it would be important to do some postdoctoral work as well. So it might be that um, somebody, a, a team at a particular university 
has secured um, an externally funded research grant and that research grant pays for a research assistant to help with that research and then that would be advertised openly usually that's advertised openly and so after you've done your PhD um, it, depending on your subject specialism you might well be eligible to apply for that post and yeah. if you were successful it would give you fantastic experience and make you very well prepared for a career in academia if if you Thanks. didn't make it in academia nevertheless the experience that you had would probably make you very well qualified to work in government as a researcher or work in company as a researcher so it wouldn't be wasted time exactly that's really useful marina have you you know have you i'm sure you have friends who have maybe gone on to pursue academics more seriously or yeah yeah i would agree with peter uh, i have friends who have uh, done their masters and uh, they some of them did not go directly for a phd but instead became research assistants and worked in different universities in the uk and then when they had some amount of funding they went on to uh, go on for their phd and then uh, we actually have a linkalees ambassador from japan called sara who is studying politics and she's currently doing her phd and she wants to go to academia but instead that does not work she's also a published political writer so yeah, that yeah. is also something that she can go back to if that does not work out for her yeah. that's really useful um last question can a student with uh, are there any courses okay first i'll ask this one are there any courses on humanitarian forensics in any of these universities okay if not do look at other uk universities who do offer this um, you can check on our study uk website there'll be plenty of other options um i'm going to ask bristol and leeds to come in on this because jayshree has answered this in the chat can a student with undergraduate political science degree pursue masters in law um holly you can come in or kasha yeah i'm happy to um go i think a lot of our law programs you'd have to double check we've got um, a few masters in law but a lot of them um, need either a law degree or a social science degree um, so for a lot of them yes you would be able to apply with a social science degree um, but double check the requirements of each of the courses yeah it's the same at bristol actually and i yeah encourage you to have a google of our ma law and you can get the entry yeah. requirements in detail Excellent. Um, I'm going to close this here. I know we've gone over time, but thank you everybody for staying with us. We still have so many students with us uh, who have, uh, you know, who've, st who've stuck on to hear all the Q&A that we did. So thank you for that. A very quick uh, a point to make. A re we have a great talk coming up with Professor Carol Mundell, uh, who is a professor of astrophysics. Uh, she's going to do uh, a talk on why we should all care about space. So it's right there in the title. It's not just for those who are interested in science or or astrophysics. I think it's something for everybody, um, including students of uh, humanities and social sciences. So please join us for that on 2nd September from 3.30 to 5 p.m. India time. It's going to be an extremely interesting conversation and it is meant for everyone. So if you know nothing about astrophysics like me, I think there's still something uh, in there for, for all of us. So, so please do. Uh, sign up for that and with that i want to bring this to a close that was i don't think we've i don't think we managed to still cover all the questions but the best part is that you we are going to share all email ids with you you can write to uh, the universities ask them more questions and uh, just be in touch with them and follow up on on what your career plans are and with that, I want to thank our wonderful panel. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, thank you for your uh, frank kind of answers and, you know, kind of making sure that we're able to answer as many questions as possible. This was a really, really exciting session for me, definitely, and I know for our students as well. We hope to see you again. Have a lovely weekend. Good evening as well. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. Very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.